I remember very well in 1989 when I had this enormous feeling of satisfaction. I did actually break through. I premiered the motorbike concerto. Ingmar Bergman was there and he was screaming bravo. He was applauding with very, very, very loud applause. It was a feeling of satisfaction. But at the same time, after having worked so hard for 10 years, I would expect I would be even more happy. Looking back at it, I really had enjoyed the challenge. Life is really not about the discovery. It is about the uninterrupted way towards discovery. Once you reach a goal to find the happiness, you're going to continue to the next goal. So this period was really about sitting a little bit in that enormous success that I had, but at the same time, look towards the future. Together with my friends at that time, Anders Hilborg, Jan Sandström, Per Lindgren, Esa Pekka Salonen, Fredrik Högberg, we were starting something completely different. We were putting on theater on the concert stage. For instance, in Don Quixote, I was narrating, I was singing, I was really acting out Don Quixote, taking off my clothes in the performance. And uh, Per Lindgren wrote this wonderful piece where I was like a toy that his daughter was playing with. He sampled her voice. She was the god operating me as a performer. And Frederick Hergberg had this wonderful Kit Bone story where I was shooting with my instrument and also smoking through the instrument. It was a very, very exciting time. I broke with the, with the system, which was very much part of me being a provocative person. At the same time, I had four children and I felt like my private life was, was sort of intruded on. So uh, this was 92, 93, so I just felt I was booked up until 95. I don't want to burn myself out. So I told my agent at that time, 1st of June, 1995, I don't want any concerts for half a year. When people saw me getting this international super career, I became a vehicle for them to get famous. Like flies buzzing around me, composers who, who craved for writing pieces for me to make them famous. And that felt a little bit awkward. ZDF and Arte France and Swedish television made a documentary about me. And a lot of composers wanted to be part of that, of course. So uh, it felt a little bit strange and, and also so difficult to also to say no to some and yes to some composers. I mean, I, I premiered lots and lots of concertos. Between 88 and 96, I think it was 66 trombone concertos. When I was approaching Berio to write a concerto for me, I visited him in his uh, suite in Amsterdam when he was conducting the Consecuba Orchestra. And I wanted to show him all these things, so I showed him what I did. And he was starting to go giggle, really. He was, he was laughing his head out when he saw the motorbike concerto and when he saw this Don Quixote. We were working together for one and a half hours or something, and at the end of it he said, Do you know Christian? Are you free next summer? Because I'm writing an opera, I want to write a part for you in the opera. So I got an opera part for Salzburg Festspiel. I was like a, a bad tenor. I was singing, 
come on, Smakif, things like this. And I was playing on mouthpieces, I was playing on the water sprinklers, I was playing on everything. And I was building the, the Tower of Babel in this opening of the Salzburg Festspiel 1999. And during those three months, when we were rehearsing three months, we worked together, Luciano and I, on his wonderful trombone concerto, which was one of his last pieces, solo, it's called. A concerto that I played with all the top symphony orchestras in the world, with Berlin Philharmonic, with Chicago Symphony, Radio France in Paris, with BBC Symphony. <laughs> We were doing a piece by Jan Sandström, the Wahlberg Variations. The thing was that the conductor wasn't really used to modern music, so this was such a very complicated piece that I knew by memory. So I more or less led the performance and took care of it. After that performance, where I basically led everything myself, the orchestra told me, we are very impressed with your work and your body language. We think you should be a conductor. I said, well, thank you very much. I don't want to be a conductor because the thing is that when you're a soloist, you're right in the middle of a fire because the conductors always say, terrible things to you about the orchestra. Oh, they, they couldn't play this, they couldn't do that, they were so speaking so much. And the musicians always told me, oh, that conductor, he can't beat, he's terrible. And then I felt, okay, am I going to be the conductor that all the musicians talk about? There's, for instance, there's a story saying two musicians, one asked the other one, uh, if you had a gun with six bullets, who on this earth would you shoot? The conductor, of course. And? What do you mean, and? Well, there's six bullets. Of course I would use all six bullets on the conductor, so I'd make sure he was dead. That's why I didn't want to be a conductor. But they were so persistent. So finally I said, OK, I'll give it a try. I will come in October 2000. So I have three years to prepare. And it was three wonderful years because I traveled with all these fantastic conductors. Neme Jarvi, Leif Segerstam, Pavo Jarvi, Gilbert Varga, James de Priest. They were fantastic teachers. And also by standing by them, I learned to do it. I was ready to jump in the water and swim around there. And I think I did a very bad job, actually, to be honest. My, my body language was terrible. But I got a fantastic review in, in The Guardian. There were many orchestras who were interested in this. So they asked me, would you come to us too? So I said, OK, I'll try two Swedish orchestras, Nordic Chamber Orchestra and Swedish Wind Ensemble. And they both offered me to be chief conductor. I had no experience. And then I was faced with being music director for two orchestras. But it was fantastic. I really, really enjoyed it. Musica Vitae, a Swedish chamber orchestra, was about to commission the 66th trombone concerto written for me, and they called Jan Sandström to write this piece. Jan called me the next day and said, Christian, you have now premiered 65 trombone concertos, and you've helped so many composers. I know how much you were part of writing a motorbike concerto. I think it's time to, for you to write your own concerto. I said, no, 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 wait a minute. But Jan said, okay, I know you can do it and I will guide you through it. Just write whatever comes out and don't be too pretentious. Don't try to write the greatest piece in history. Just write whatever comes out of your mind. I'll help you to guide you through it. And that became my first composition, Araben. So uh, I did the premiere and I found myself the next day with two commissions. Two major Swedish institutions commissioned a piece each. Since that day I have been absolutely pounded with commissions. There's always been like a queue of like three, four pieces. So it was like opening a Pandora's box. What Sandstrom really helped me with was to say that if the piece itself is bad, then the piece should be bad. If a theme is ugly, the theme should be ugly. 
if a song is sentimental, it should be sentimental. Just take it like a child. A child that makes a drawing just makes it. It's when he becomes six or seven where parents say, it's, that was beautiful, that was not so beautiful. That's when they start to get cramp. And that's the cramp we all have. And if you can just let that go and follow the flow, it, it makes a huge difference. And that's what I did with composing, I think. At this point, I still had some very important goals. One was to make one of my favorite composers of all time, Alain Petrichon, known to the world. I was devastated by the fact that he was completely unknown in the world. So, since quite a while, I have been trying to promote this composer. And I had a very awkward discussion with a London agent and I was trying to tell them to present this fantastic composer to the orchestras and they said yes of course we should do this after six months I heard nothing so I said okay why why no response at least they could say no and why they say no actually Christian we never approached them we thought it was neither in your nor in our interest that you tried to boisterously promote unknown Swedish avant-garde composers. I thought it was one of the most stupid comments I've ever heard. All this started a process in my head that the only way for me to be able to promote this is to become independent. So in 2016, I left my general manager and created my own firm, Araben Art Events, hiring a few people and from here I can be completely independent and not anymore be imprisoned by the fact that this has to be commercial in any way. I was of course a big step and you don't know you you just pull yourself out of the conventional classical music world at the same time as you criticize them for being too commercial or corrupt. So what could have happened was that I would be banned by all the orchestras. And I was ready to take that, to stay at this beautiful place for the rest of my life and just compose, like Petrichon did. But what actually happened was I found myself in a position where I could tailor make my whole schedule with the help of these employees and make two, three seasons ahead that was better than any season I had before. The fact that I could have direct contact with the orchestras was making it so much more easy. Never try to be successful. Do it for your own sake. It's not the result that's important. It's the journey. Even if you reach the position you dreamt of, whatever you do, continue the journey. Because once you stop, you die in a way. The journey has to go on. I think the most important thing is to continue the uninterrupted discovery of life. It's not money, it's not career, it's not results. We all succeed sometimes, we fail sometimes. And there's no way we can judge ourselves as bad or good composers or bad or good this and that. The discovery itself is not what's important. It's the way towards it. This is what I have done all my life. I feel now at 60, I see ahead of me 30 beautiful years of new discovery. I really hope that you get inspired by this and will continue your journey and will continue to try to do something good for humanity, whatever it is. <laughs>